Thank you all for being here uh, and welcome. My name is Matt McRae. I have the privilege of working for our Children's Trust based here in Eugene. Um, super excited to hear what these uh, folks have to share with us. Uh, you are the first audience in the country to hear about the results of this work, so um, count yourself fortunate. Uh, so brief introductions. Um, Jim Williams is an associate professor at the University of San Francisco and an expert in energy systems. He's the director of the Deep Decarbonization Pathways Project that has developed science-based decarbonization plans for more than a dozen of the world's major countries, including the United States. And so Jim is gonna be doing a, a share of the presentation. Ben Haley and Ryan Jones are co-founders of Evolved Energy Research, which is a research firm founded to help inform governments and utilities and investors as they navigate the rapid change and uncertainties inherent in today's interdependent energy systems. Both have been heavily involved in decarbonization research as well. And finally, um, Julia Olson's gonna give us a brief introduction. Uh, she's the executive director and chief legal counsel for Our Children's Trust, a Eugene-based nonprofit um, Supporting young people, you may all be familiar with the, the legal cases that she's working on, uh, who, the young people who are using the court system to try and compel action, necessary action on climate change. So uh, Julia's gonna start us off. All right, hi everybody. I'm just here to tell you a little bit about why the work that EER is doing is so important and tell you a little bit about our case. So <clears throat> Juliana versus United States is the constitutional climate change case against the federal government, which you've probably heard about. So we have three principles. We uplift the youth voice on the issue of climate change. And when we're litigating our cases, our goal is to get science-based policies in order to address the climate crisis. Skip over that. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the background science that informs the work that EER has done. So most of you have probably seen this curve. This is the carbon dioxide curve that actually was, uh, the initial measurements were taken by GS Calendar starting in the early part of the 1900s. And we are now at over about 407 parts per million as a global average. And a lot of the really important data about historic CO2 levels going back hundreds of thousands of years comes from the ice core samples that are taken. Um, there's a picture of what that looks like and a graph that goes into the year 2000. And you can see that over time since the Industrial Revolution, CO2 levels have just been skyrocketing from the 280 parts per million baseline that they used to be at during the time in which human civilization evolved. And I love this graph. I think it's one of the most important contributions from scientists because it correlates atmospheric CO2 with global temperature and then sea level rise. So really climate change is a numbers game and scientists can measure very accurately what kind of temperatures we can expect on Earth and therefore what kind of sea level rise we can expect on Earth at different levels of CO2. <clears throat> and the reason why global heating is such a problem is a lot of this heat gets stored in our oceans. Over 90% of the excess heat that we're creating is stored there. And we all know what happens if you heat water that has ice in it or touches ice, you start to see a lot of melting. Um, this image actually comes from a paper that was just published on the, so the image on the left comes from a paper that was published on Antarctica melting. And Dr. Eric Ringno, who's one of our experts, is a co-author on this paper. And it just shows how substantial the melting of Antarctica is. And they are now concerned about not only losing the West Antarctic ice sheet, but the East Antarctic ice sheet. And then the picture on the right shows that the same thing is happening in Greenland as well. And for those who don't know, the last time CO2 levels were over 400 parts per million, our seas were 70 feet higher. <clears throat> so the solution to this catastrophic problem is to bring CO2 levels down. And that requires steep emission reductions. And when we look to the scientific data on what levels we should really be at to try to preserve our ice sheets, 
which is one of the biggest threats to the planet, is the melting of the ice sheets. <clears throat> we, we look to Dr. Hansen, and not just Dr. Hansen, but he has how many colleagues, Matt? 40 scientists from institutions all over the world have all agreed that in terms of restoring the energy balance of the planet, we need to return to lower than 350 parts per million of atmospheric CO2 and keep long-term heating to no more than one degree Celsius through the course of this century. So 350 by 2100 is a target that's very important. But in addition to Dr. Hansen and his colleagues, there's another really important um, guideline for CO2 levels, <clears throat> and it's our coral reefs. So we have these two problems. We have the, the energy imbalance. We also have ocean acidification. And for the reefs, both in terms of acidific acidification and warming, we need to keep CO2 below 350. And there's a real consensus in the coral reef ecology community and the ocean science community that 350 is the maximum level. So this is sort of the image. And you know, one thing I will say about this number 350, it's not the end point. When I asked Dr. Ringno, who's the expert on ice sheets, what the safe level of CO2 is, his first reaction is 280 because that's the last time when our ice sheets were really at a stable point uh, that allowed human civilization to develop. So he actually thinks as we get into the next century that CO2 levels should really come down even below 350. And before I turn it over, I just want to show you all this graphic. This is a combination of different government sort of roadmaps or not quite plans, but ideas that our government has had throughout the last 30, 30 years or so to reduce carbon dioxide. And none of these were implemented. But it shows you where we could have been had our government actually acted on the recommendations of the experts within our nation who were rec making these recommendations. And so EER, is going to actually show you, based on the failure to do this, where we're at now and how it's much harder to do now, but that it's still feasible. And with that, I'm gratefully going to turn it over to Dr. Jim Williams, who serves as an expert in the Juliana case and has been part of this great team doing this amazing work. You're good. Thank you, Julia, and thanks, everybody, for coming today. <clears throat> so the title of our talk is Deeper Decarbonization, U.S. Pathways to uh, 350 Parts Per Million. Um, and uh, we're going to start with the Deep Decarbonization Pathways Project, of which I'm the director. Uh, it began in um, 2013. Um, as a consortium of independent research teams from uh, the 16 highest greenhouse gas emitting countries around the world. And the idea was um, to develop national blueprints for limiting warming to 2 degrees C, which at that time was a sort of commonly uh, chosen uh, target. Um, and we'll talk about sort of what the emerging consensus is now in a minute. But anyway, that was the target at the time. Uh, those teams, countries, represented about three quarters of global emissions and uh, included uh, both the, um, the, all the rich countries and uh, the biggest developing countries. Um, and the reason to do this was to change the conversation. There had been a sort of a a set of disastrous outcomes at the international climate meetings for a while. And uh, in the meantime, we'd been working in California, helping to develop California's energy and climate policy. And we thought some of the same uh, approaches might be useful in the international uh, stage to sort of move the focus away from incrementalism to transformation and 
uh, from abstraction to problem solving, from opaqueness to transparency, and con from conventional wisdom to concreteness. In other words, um, describe what actually needs to happen. And so um, uh, the US team, of whom uh, Ben and Ryan are, are both members with me, um, we developed uh, uh, a set of what we call uh, deep decarbonization pathways for the United States. Um, uh, and produced two uh, reports, one called Pathways to Deep Decarbonization in the United States, the other one called uh, Policy Implications of Deep Decarbonization in the United States. That was back in 2015. And uh, it was a modeling exercise. Um, and uh, you'll see here it says constraints. And uh, that basically tells you what it was that we were trying to accomplish, which was demonstrate uh, uh, the achievement of an 80% reduction in greenhouse gases below 1990 levels by the year 2050, and that it could be accomplished while, um, while also uh, having business as usual population and economic growth um, supplying business as usual levels of energy services, um, heating, cooling, industrial processes, whatever, uh, using commercially available uh, technologies, uh, no pie in the sky, um, that it would represent infrastructure inertia. There's tens of thousands of types of different equipment, each of which has its own lifetime, and those things uh, sort of have their own momentum in the uh, in the economy, uh, that it could be done with a very reliable electricity system. Um, uh, and um, for, this, for that project, uh, no early retirement to actually uh, let um, uh, equipment retire when it reached the end of its economic life. Um, also for that project, no negative emissions technologies. Uh, and so, uh, uh, the, on the bottom uh, uh, left hand of the screen, you see an example of the infrastructure inertia that's showing the stock of light duty vehicles, that is passenger cars rolling over from the current um, gasoline engines to uh, basically forms of electric propulsion, uh, uh, fuel cells and uh, electric, uh, battery electric vehicles. And on the right side at the bottom, you see um, the uh, a, a example of a weekly electricity dispatch and how that works in a, in a particular operating area of the country, um, just illustrative of the sort of uh, detailed analysis that was done on this, looking every hour throughout the year over the, the whole pan, span of time out to the middle of the century. Uh, as as the electricity system is transformed from what it is today to something that's very low carbon. And the conclusion of all of that was that an 80% reduction by 2050 uh, is technically feasible and that it is affordable. Um, the assumption there was that the current land sink, which is the uptake of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere by ecosystems, mostly by trees, uh, would remain constant, and we made that assumption because right now there's no consensus in the scientific community about which direction it would go. And so uh, there's a certain amount of CO2 taken out of the atmosphere through natural processes. The assumption for this work was that remained constant over time. And when all of that said and done, then the 80% reduction target was met. We looked at uh, multiple different ways of, of getting to that end point. Uh, we built four cases that uh, we called high renewables, high nuclear, high carbon capture and storage, and mixed. Um, those are the different electricity mixes. There are many other variations in the cases. It wasn't all about electricity. Uh, but the point was, uh, through very different technology roads or pathways, you were able to get to uh, a level of emissions reduction that was compatible with this 80 by 50 target. And you'll see the, a little uh, box up there that's showing US per capita emissions going down by a factor of 10, by, by, by 90% over, uh, over basically 30, 
35-year uh, timeline. Um, and this was done with, uh, with we, we did the analysis with uh, rigorous cost accounting, and uh, the result was, um, on average, for these different scenarios, you could do this at a cost of about 1% of GDP above the high carbon business as usual case. That is, um, we currently spend six or seven percent of our GDP on energy services. It would be, be, it would be another percent, give or take a percent of, of variation around these cases uh, would be the cost. And so um, that was the basis of our, our argument that this is an affordable change. Um, the, these results were based on what we referred to as three pillars, um, which is uh, three things that need to happen no matter how, uh, in particular, you, um, you accomplish it. That is to say, uh, we had different scenarios, high renewables, et cetera, um, but all of them had to get to the same place. There's some benchmarks, and those benchmarks are the three pillars. One was um, that uh, electricity itself has to be very deeply decarbonized um, uh, uh, on, on the order of, of, of a factor of 30 below uh, current levels. Um, and uh, that uh, existing uses of fossil fuels um, uh, in, in combustion end uses, like in your car or in the furnace in your house, need to be replaced by uh, very low carbon uh, electricity. And finally, there need to be very high levels of energy efficiency. So those are the three pillars. And that was true for all the uh, scenarios we looked at for the United States. And it was also true for all of the other country teams looking at their own countries. We're showing just sort of at random China, India, and the UK showing the same three metrics. You, uh, it's basically physics. You can't get there unless you do these things. And so we have an advantage in thinking about the transformation. Uh, independent of the particulars of the case, we know uh, uh, something about how we have to get there. I'll just uh, mention one other uh, thing about sort of the post um, uh, 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 post Paris timeline of our, our work a little bit. We've been uh, we've been developing uh, 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 extensions of the work that we did before uh, in various contexts, including. Uh, quite a bit of state and regional work, both in the Northeast and the Northwest and the Midwest of the United States, working uh, in some cases with, um, with utilities, in some cases with, uh, with uh, community and environmental groups, in some cases with state government. Um, so Julia already alluded to the importance of the 350 parts per million by uh, 2100 uh, target. Um, uh, there has been a lot of literature um, uh, published over a long period of time expressing the idea that uh, if we let warming get as high as two degrees C, we uh, may very well see irreversible changes. And even short of that, uh, as the uh, IPC's recent 1.5 degree report uh, says that there are uh, risks in allowing warming to reach even that level. Uh, there are two papers by Jim Hansen here um, that were sort of pioneering, uh, or built on his pioneering work. He's been saying for a long time that the paleoclimate record tells us that we need to get back to something uh, like 350 ppm or below. Uh, and without explaining all of the sort of uh, intricacies of this um, graphic right here. The point is uh, we took as our uh, objective trajectories for uh, emissions decline globally that appear in Jim Hansen's papers. And so what you're going to see from us in the rest of our time here is how in nuts and bolts terms you'd actually achieve the trajectories that get us back to 350 50 parts per million uh, by the end of this uh, by the end of this century and and below uh, a, a one degree um, sort of a, 
uh, limit to the temperature increase of global warming. Now, um, one aspect of this um, of, and of the situation that we're in is uh, not only have we um, sort of uh, failed to act repeatedly as a, as a nation and as a planet to get control over this problem, but there's also dawning realization that what we used to think might be an okay level of warming probably isn't an okay level of warming. And those two things combined actually mean that the, the, the rate of decline is gonna have to be much more severe um, than people in the past have been talking about. And so when Julia says we're doing something here for the first time, we, we haven't seen too much uh, 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 work that takes seriously the idea of a 350 parts per million. Uh, limit, and that's what we've been trying to do. But it, what it comes down to uh, is this. Um, if you're going to, uh, to be going, uh, approaching some target like that, you've got to do two things simultaneously. You've got to reduce the CO2 that you are emitting primarily from fossil fuel combustion, primarily from energy, and you also have to remove CO2 from the atmosphere and you have to remove more of it than currently happens in natural processes. And that means that there are going to be some uh, trade-offs made. I'm, I don't know if I'll be the first one to bear this news, but, uh, but we should be uh, sober in facing these prospects. What we have to do um, to um, preserve the climate system is a pretty momentous task. And, uh, and they're gonna, uh, we're gonna have to uh, deal with the fact that some of the things are, may involve uncomfortable choices. Um, that lower temperature targets mean bigger reductions in CO2, and that uh, the lower you go, the, the, the bigger the trade-offs are involved. And from the standpoint of land use, there are three things, sequestering carbon in ecosystems, uh, growing bioenergy feedstocks, inciting renewable energy. Where does all that wind and solar power go? Uh, all of those things are going to affect land use. There is no scenario without land impacts. Um, but of course, uh, letting climate change go unabated is the worst land impact of all, potentially. Um, so the hope is that good science and stakeholder involvement early in the process can allow M land impacts to be anticipated, prioritized, mitigated, worked around, that we get the best available outcomes. Uh, my last slide here is uh, another aspect of these sort of trade-offs is, is the toolkit that we're working with. Climate change is an industrial scale problem that requires industrial scale solutions. We're talking about billions of tons of CO2 avoided, and we're talking about um, uh, 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 trillions of watts, that is billion, uh, millions of megawatts of solar and wind power. We're talking about hundreds of millions of vehicles. Uh, it's a very big problem. And the solutions are challenging enough using all the available tools we have for decarbonization, including some that are not popular, like nuclear power, like bioenergy, like carbon capture and storage. But if you take these tools off the table, um, it will make it uh, more difficult to achieve the 350 ppm pathways. So with that, let me turn it over to my colleague, Ben Haley. I think we can skip who, skip probably past who, who we are. Uh, I will just say that people often tell uh, me that I have the best job in climate change. Um, because most people have to kind of deal with the nature of the challenge in terms of, you know, sea level rise and ice sheets and all that sort of thing. Um, and my challenge is kind of very different, uh, and our challenge is very different. We're, uh, we get to do the problem solving aspect of this. Um, you know, it, uh, it can be daunting, and I'll, I think what we'll show here is kind of the, the scale of what we'll need to do to really tackle that challenge. But, uh, I hope people find you know, what we show here today also motivating in the sense that there is a solution to this. Um, and we've found that motivating for kind of audiences around the, around the country and around the globe that people really like to see that people are, are 
kind of designing these energy systems um, for a decarbonized world uh, and sort of maintaining that optimism even in the in the face of some uh, lack of momentum in, in other areas but um, so first I'll talk about kind of the nature of our challenge. So obviously the globe has a significant challenge and that's why we're, we're doing this type of analysis. Uh, but we actually had a very significant modeling challenge uh, as well. Uh, we needed to basically develop models that could actually uh, deploy technologies that uh, a lot of analyses had never even thought of um, because of the types of targets uh, and the types of systems that they were modeling. You know, I'll say right now that there isn't a government on Earth that has a model that can model a deeply decarbonized energy system. I mean, that's depressing in and of itself. You know, not only might we not actually do it, we don't even know how to look at it uh, from a governmental perspective. Um, so, you know, that's kind of the contribution we're trying to make um, to say that these systems are real. Uh, they can meet the energy system needs that, that we've set out for them. Um, you know, driving miles, heating homes, all those sorts of things. Uh, and they can do it at a relatively reasonable cost and, and, and not doing it and not taking action is still a choice. You know, we're, it's, there is no inevitability to these things. So um, I'll say one of the principal differences here between deep decarbonization, which Jim talked about, and deeper decarbonization, which I'm gonna talk about, uh, is uh, really the pace. So it's a little bit of a misnomer when I say deeper versus deep because really uh, the cumulative emissions target is uh, creating an imperative for early action. So there's a lot that's probably going to be left on the table in terms of climate action in the next 10 or 15 years. You know, every minute that a coal power plant burns coal uh, is basically a lost opportunity cost in terms of reducing emissions. It's the cheapest thing we could possibly do. Uh, and you know, every minute we sit and watch those power plants burn coal, it just means we're going to have to deploy more technologies later. Um, and so you know, the clock ticks, and the clock ticks in my head, unfortunately, uh, but the clock is definitely ticking uh, over the next 10 years in terms of um, what will be necessitated in the longer term if we don't take that action. Um, and uh, sort of how we're able to achieve that pace is a combination of just doing some of the things we know we needed to do, but doing them sooner. Um, but it also is doing things and deploying technologies uh, in ways that people haven't really actually investigated um, because they've always been imagined as sort of a post-2050 problem or solution. Uh, so you're going to see the deployment of direct air capture, for example, uh, which is very hot from a technology perspective but hasn't made it into any decarbonization plans um, in any states, though uh, California's net zero emissions will almost certainly see uh, the deployment of that. Um, and um, let me just go to the zero definitions. The other thing we did to make it a little bit more difficult on ourselves uh, is we acknowledge the fact that um, we don't want to just be able to hit, a, hit this target under sort of optimal or optimistic conditions. Um, so we know that we are doing things that we don't do now, and we have to anticipate that we'll be able to do them, but we can't basically predict that we'll be able to do them. Um, and so we wanted to basically test the robustness of any of our scenarios against the inability to do some things that are really critical to our base scenario. So the first thing we do uh, is constrain biomass. Um, so there are projections about how much zero carbon biomass the U.S. can develop and deploy uh, through 2050. Uh, but, you know, you have to say who knows a little bit to that. Uh, that's an entirely new energy economy uh, that encapsulates sort of land use. Uh, and refineries and all sorts of things, fuel delivery systems, uh, that's a big lift. Um, so basically, we say, what happens if that can't grow to the extent that we think? Uh, so we reduce that by 50%. Uh, the second scenario, and we'll get into tech nets, but basically, are there negative emissions technologies? Uh, this is often a criticism deployed against analyses uh, for deep productions that they use these things called nets. Um, and nets are either direct air capture or bioenergy with CCS. Basically, anything that, that takes uh, CO2 out of the atmosphere and puts it in the ground and functionally you know, is a net negative emissions technology. Um, we have a scenario where we don't actually do those, so we see if that's feasible. Um, the third one is low or slow electrification. So I'm going to get into how important electrification is. Um, but electrification is fundamentally going to be a consumer decision. Uh, you know, buying electric vehicles, buying heat pumps, um, all those sorts of activities. 
we don't know if we're able to induce that electrification at the pace that we want. Um, there are tools we have in our toolkit to, to encourage that adoption. Um, Oregon has policies, for example, encouraging the adoption of electric vehicles. Uh, but we don't know how fast that can go. And so uh, we slow it down and try to see if we can still meet the target. Um, the fourth uh, sensitivity is low land nets. Um, so basically, uh, you know, there are things that can take uh, CO2 out of the atmosphere that aren't, you know, direct air capture or an industrial solution. Uh, there are land-based solutions. If we're able to achieve those, then the target in the energy sector is not quite as daunting. Um, but we say, okay, well, what happens if we're not able to achieve those? And so we, we uh, give ourselves that challenge of basically trying to meet um, 47 gigatons of CO2 from the energy sector, which is obviously significantly even less than 74, which is our base case uh, amount of emissions left. Um, and then finally, no new less nuclear. Than 10 years of the current rate. Yeah, less than 10 years of the current rate. So um, that's that's fast. Um, and finally, no new nuclear. Uh, nuclear and 350 have like been connected, I think, in a lot of ways, uh, and we wanted to see if basically. Uh, that was a necessity. You know, is nuclear the only way we can get to 350 ppm? Do we have to deploy nuclear? Uh, so we have a scenario, actu scenario actually uh, where we don't. Uh, and based functionally that gets replaced by more renewables. Um, and, we, and we show that that's a feasible system as well. Um, some additional assumptions of note. Uh, we're trying to meet the same energy service demand in all scenarios. So basically, same vehicle miles traveled, same amount of heating in buildings, same amount of cooling in buildings, all sorts of those things. Uh, that is conservative. You know, we also have the option of maybe not driving every mile we could possibly want. Uh, that would be great. Um, that will not change sort of the nature of the systems we'll be building, but it will fundamentally change the scale of them. Um, so if we don't need to meet the same amount of energy services, we can build a smaller system. That just means less land use impacts from renewable energy deployment, um, whole lots of sort of co-benefits of basically scaling that system down. Um, but we don't have that as an assumption that we have to do that to be able to meet this. Um, the emissions we analyzed are principally in the energy system from fossil fuel combustion, uh, but we also have industrial process emissions, non-energy use of fuels, and waste incineration, which is a smaller portion of that um, and the framing we've, we've um, talked about. But we also, uh, we also employ a constraint in 2050. So you know the 350 ppm has a budget out to 2100. We're only modeling to 2050. So we basically want to see if we can maintain that trajectory through 2050, which means we have to have a, a constraint also in 2050. So that we're not saying that we have to jump from 2050 all the way down to 2051. Um, so, uh, good news. Um, I'm not up here with the worst possible message for this conference. Uh, we, uh, we have basically determined that it is technically feasible, kind of given the constraints that we've employed uh, to uh, reduce US fossil CO2 emissions to levels consistent with a 350 ppm target. Um, you know, that's, that's probably the most bold and declarative statement that's been made on that front, uh, I think. Ever, um, so <laughs> looking at Jim. Uh, yeah, I don't know what that. Yeah, for what that's for what that. Yeah, for what that's worth. Um, you know, Jim talked about three pillars. I actually am going to sit talk about four pillars. Uh, but it's efficiency, decarbonizing electricity, electrification, and carbon capture, which is the fourth pillar. Um, and it's more of the three pillars and an additional pillar, basically. Um, and we'll get into that. Um, so. Immediate action, uh, you know, I think we all feel that imperative in this room, but it's even more imperative uh, than maybe even we think. Uh, we basically have less than 14 years remaining at current emissions levels. Um, so, uh, you know, we have to reduce the slope, of, or we have to reduce our emissions pretty precipitously, and you'll see the slope of those emissions reductions. Um, and the net system costs in our base case scenario uh, are about 1% to 2% of projected GDP. Um, I'm going to show you that in the context of historical energy system spending, uh, but we blew uh, way past the, that amount uh, anytime oil price spikes. Uh, we're up in the 12 to 14 percent range in terms of GDP to, to energy system spending. So, you know, we're well within the historical range um, of energy system spending. So, again, you know, anyone who says this would bankrupt us is, you know, that's kind of historically not true. 
Um, and uh, I think what we're trying to say is it, it, it really does, uh, it is maintained as a choice if we don't, if we don't want to pursue this type of, type of strategy. Um, so this is a little bit small, I apologize for that. Um, but you know, what you can see is there are significant differences from the 2020 on the right in every, in every chart, uh, to the, I mean on the left, to the 2050 on the right. So the first is electricity decarbonization. So basically, coal obviously goes away by 2050. It goes away as soon as possible. Um, the only thing that's left in terms of uh, thermal generation on the system is gas power plants. Um, in terms of energy efficiency, we're basically down to a third uh, per unit of GDP where we are now. That's a combination of, of a lot of activities. So there's energy efficiency, there's electrification, which is fundamentally more efficient. Uh, so an electric vehicle is more efficient than an internal combustion engine. And then the other component of that is that the US has been transitioning to a service economy for a very long time. It continues that transition to 2050. So per unit of GDP, we use less energy. That's just fundamental in, in sort of every scenario. Uh, electrification. Um, so direct electrification and the use of electric fuels uh, is basically 60% of our final energy demand. Uh, it's 20% right now. So if we're a fuel-based energy economy now, electricity is really kind of the backbone of that future energy economy. That means, you know, no refineries. Um, it doesn't need as many pipelines. Um, you know, we're really oriented around fuel delivery right now. Uh, and in the future, it's really electricity delivery. And we'll get into some of the challenges of that. Um, but the, 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 uh, the logic of that is that our decarbonized energy sources are primarily electric. So other than biomass, uh, the only way to deliver those decarbonized energy sources is through electricity. And so you need to change how you use energy uh, so that you can access the decarbonized upstream supply. Um, and finally, carbon capture, uh, that's about 800 million metric tons in 2050, um, starting, sorry? In one case. In one case. Um, and uh, there are more, there is a little bit more in some other cases. Um, that is uh, nowhere near kind of like the technical cap capacity of, of CO2 sequestration, but people have uh, differing views on, on um, kind of the safety of different uh, options in terms of sequestration, but we're, within, we're, we're in the less than 1% um, of the total capacity uh, in terms of how much we use per year. Um, the, uh, the U.S. could technically store all its CO2 uh, for a very long time, um, but it would be economically a terrible option. You really only want to do that kind of at the end as your last resort. Um, and, and you employ that CO2 in heavy industry, biorefining, and direct air capture. Uh, you have too many options in electricity to really rely on it, um, or to really need to rely on it in terms of, of power plants with CCS. Um, so what happens when, from the base case scenario when we, do, when we add these constraints? Um, so first of all, if we constrain biomass, if we don't think there is much, as much biomass uh, as is projected, uh, you really have to replace your uh, biofuels with electric fuels. Electric fuels are basically turning wind and solar into fuels uh, via an electrolysis pathway. Um, so that's the trade-off, basically. If you don't have biofuels, you have to build more wind and solar. Um, constrained tech nets. Uh, basically, if you don't have tech nets, you actually have to go faster earlier. Um, so it's harder to go really low in the long term without those tech nets. And so you have to go lower in the, in the early term because you, cause you um, can't go as deep later. Um, in terms of low electrification, uh, low electrification, uh, you still need to access those decarbonized energy sources of wind and solar, basically. Uh, but instead of doing that through a direct electrification, you have to do that through electric fuels. You don't want to have to do that many electric fuels. It's not an efficient process. There are huge land use implications for basically having to create that pathway of wind, solar, electrolysis, and then power to X, and then into a vehicle, for example. Um, so direct electrification is, is far preferable, um, but it can be done. Uh, it just illustrates the imperative, basically, of electrification. Um, low land nets is basically all hands on deck. Uh, you know, that budget is so uh, tight that you need to deploy, basically, all your technology solutions as fast as possible. Um, no new nuclear, I alluded to this earlier, but you can run a reliable electricity system without nuclear. Uh, that's a, that is 
definitely a thing that can be done. Um, and so the substitution of wind and solar for nuclear uh, has kind of a very limited impact in terms of cost. Um, and, and we just wanted to demonstrate the feasibility of that. So what does the trajectory look like? Julia showed those charts. Uh, I don't know if anyone noticed that basically every plan that the government has ever come up with um, always looked real like straight and really relatively modest. Um, the, you know, what that, effectively that's just pushing the problem out. Uh, the issue is uh, there are a lot of opportunities early for reducing emissions um, and, and kind of a straight line um, is not the optimal way of achieving this 350 ppm target. Uh, it's actually to kind of go a little bit faster in the, in the medium term. Uh, and so you can see it kind of um, uh, goes really steep from basically 2025 to 2040. Uh, and then those last emissions to go from, to basically a zero emissions economy are really expensive. Um, and so you don't want to have to go as deep. Uh, you don't want to have to be basically in kind of the, the low land nets uh, case. You, you'd like to go kind of around the, the 500 million metric ton mark. Um, but there's an imperative if you, have a, if you have a tighter budget. So where do those emissions basically come from? Um, so you can't, it's going to be difficult to see the coal as again, it's basically gone by 2025. Um, yellow is oil. Um, so that, that basically the steepness of that trajectory is a combination of two factors. One, you're electrifying all your vehicles basically as fast as you can. The second is any residual fuel use becomes bio-based. Um, or electric fuels. Uh, and so that combination basically is driving fossil fuels out of that system. Uh, we use look at fossil fuels basically for transportation. There's, there's very little in other sectors. Um, the residual fossil emissions almost always come from natural gas. There's a logic to that. It's basically our, you know, from a CO2 perspective, it's our lowest emissions fossil fuel, but economically it's our cheapest fossil fuel. Uh, and so it's the, it's the only fossil fuel that remains in the system um, so I would not go so far as to call it a bridge fuel, but it is a fuel that kind of uh, exists longer than some of these other types. Uh, and on the bottom there, um, we're actually showing gross sort of before capture um, above the line. Below, we're actually showing the carbon capture. Um, so you can see uh, in the low land nets and the low electrification case, uh, we actually have carbon capture a little bit higher than our, our base case. Um, but it, uh, it, it ramps up to around a gigaton uh, by 2050. I talked about this earlier. These are uh, historical energy system spending uh, on basically the left of the chart. So basically before 2020, uh, that represents uh, historical spending. Um, and you can see that uh, the oil crisis, for example, uh, and even high oil prices, if we remember from the early to well, early 2000s, um, created, a, created an energy system where uh, we were up around 10 to 13 uh, percent of our GDP was spent on energy. Uh, you can see to the right, uh, that's our, those are our energy systems. Um, so, you know, it goes up a little bit when we have a decarbonized energy system, but we don't even remotely approach kind of historical highs. Um, so, you know, from just from that basis, I think we can say uh, that anticipation of being bankrupt by these activities is probably off the mark. Um, this includes any demand side spending on energy efficiency and electrification. Um, so it includes basically everything we spend on power plants, everything we spend on vehicles uh, or incremental cost of electric vehicles, energy efficiency. Um, and, you know, we're well within the historical bounds. Um, this is going to be really tough to see, but I'll just say um, that uh, the principal costs in a decarbonized energy system come from basically three components. Uh, the electricity system, so wind and solar becomes, uh, it's that blue actually, um, so we spend a heck of a lot more on renewables. Uh, we spend more on the electricity grid because we need to deliver those renewables. Um, we spend more on demand side equipment, so electrified equipment and efficient equipment cost a little bit more. Um, so there's an incremental cost of those, those vehicles. Uh, and we now have a bio economy uh, or a biofuels economy. And we have to basically build those refineries, uh, bio refineries and, um, and access those feedstocks. We pay for all of that. Uh, basically through the reduction of spending on fossil fuels. So we use less natural gas, we use less oil, uh, and we can use that to basically pay for decarbonized technology. Um, 
what do we need to do by decade? Um, so these are, these are uh, basically robust against our scenarios, or for the most part, there may be a few exceptions. Uh, but in the 2020s, really what we need to do is decarbonize electricity as fast as we can. Uh, the easiest way is turning off the coal uh, and switching to natural gas. Um, we do actually still need to build some natural gas plants. We can build natural gas plants if we can reduce that coal. Uh, but what we really need to be doing is building renewables as fast as possible. Um, and so we at least are seeing that type of activity across the country, but it would need to be uh, accelerated. Um, we need to maintain the existing nuclear fleet. Uh, you know, when we, every time we turn off a nuclear plant and that gets switched to fossil, uh, it's a pretty big loss in terms of emissions. So maintaining that, you know, to the extent that it's safe um, should be a priority. We shouldn't let those retire for economic reasons. Uh, that doesn't make any sense. Um, we need to basically start uh, developing infrastructure for transportation electrification, so charging stations, things of that nature. Um, and, uh, and we really need to begin that electrification process. In the 2030s, we've, we've really hit, the, hit our stride in terms of electrification. So anything that really can be economically electrified starts being electri economically electrified. Uh, so all new vehicle sales in the 2030s need to be electric. Light duty vehicle sales, a lot of heavy duty vehicles need to be electric. Um, our homes need to be electrified, so sales of water heaters and space heaters uh, really need to move towards heat pumps. Um, and so that's, that's, and we're building renewables basically to support that as well. Um, so we're gonna see a lot of electric load growth and that needs to be decarbonized. Um, we're also getting into the biofuels game in the 2030s. Um, the 2040s is where we start deploying some technologies that people aren't used to seeing around town, I will say. Um, we have direct air capture coming online. Uh, we have an electric fuels economy, so we have a lot of hydrogen electrolysis, um, continued renewables development, um, and really kind of uh, a full deployment of biofuels and biofuels with carbon capture. Um, so, Let's look a little bit about what the electric sector uh, looks like. Uh, so the top is renewable capacity, the middle is nuclear, and the bottom is CCS. Those scales are different, but that's 3,000 uh, gigawatts uh, for renewables, 200 gigawatts for nuclear, and 60 for CCS. Those relative scales kind of tell you the relative importance. Uh, renewables and renewable development is the principal strategy um, and is really uh, an economic strategy in, in a deep decarbonization world. Um, wind and solar and then managing the problems that those can cause on the system uh, are really kind of the economic linchpin of these scenarios and we'll talk about how we, how we do that. Um, you can see nuclear development in all the cases except where we restrict it. Uh, so there is a role for nuclear in areas that have limited wind and solar. Uh, if you don't want to build nuclear, there are ways around it, um, but sort of our model would select that if, it let, if you let it. Uh, and then there's limited CCS for electricity, electricity balancing. Again, really only in regions where you don't have renewables available. Um, this shows actually electric load, electricity load growth. Uh, people are not, probably not used to uh, thinking about how much load grows on the electricity system, but for the past five years, it basically hasn't grown at all. Uh, so we're, utilities are seeing basically flat load right now. Um, in the future, that goes to basically three to five percent growth, which is, you know, uh, starting to get towards places that they've never been um, or haven't been in a very long time um, before kind of electrification took off. Um, but five percent load growth is a lot of infrastructure, so it's a lot of distribution substations, uh, it's a lot of transmission infrastructure. That's a challenge. Um, but electricity is basically the backbone of these energy systems, and so. Uh, that meeting that challenge is pretty imperative. Um, the kind of the third challenge in terms of uh, making electricity the center of our energy economy, uh, in addition to needing to deploy that many renewables, uh, needing to meet that type of load growth, is balancing that system. So right now, we can just turn a power plant on or turn a power plant up and down to meet our demands hour by hour. Uh, in the future, wind and solar don't really care what we want, um, and so we basically have to manage our loads uh, instead. And so all those electric fuels, direct air capture facilities, batteries, vehicles, uh, they're all being operated flexibly, and you can actually see the pattern. The pattern is that they operate in the middle of the day when we have excess solar, um, because that's gonna be a pretty consistent condition on these systems, because um, solar is cheap and, and you wanna use as much of it as you can. 
Um, and that's how we're mitigating against overgeneration conditions. So um, I talked about biofuels, really important, uh, but, it's not, but it's also important not to overstate the scale. Uh, sometimes when we think of our current energy system, we are understating the scale of it. Uh, we are basically creating kind of a bioeconomy for fuels, but refining capacity uh, never goes above 20% of where we are now in terms of fossil fuels. Um, so all petroleum refineries are a huge, they're huge amounts of infrastructure right now. Um, we're kind of developing this new industry, but it's, it's much smaller than the fossil fuel economy in terms of overall infrastructure. Uh, and those facilities really do need to be outfitted with carbon capture, um, kind of to double up on emissions reductions. Um, other infrastructure that's really important is hydrogen. Uh, so it's in addition to biofuels, it's electric fuels. Uh, so it's using all that over generation on the electricity system um, and uh, producing fuels with this new hydrogen infrastructure. Uh, and then uh, direct air capture. Uh, so it doesn't show up in all of our scenarios, but it does show up basically as the backstop to scenarios where we've kind of tied one hand behind our back. Um, and so it operates, as I said, as a basically a backstop. Um, and it uses a lot of the overgeneration on the electricity system, uh, operates when we have excess renewables, uh, and either stores that CO2 in the ground uh, or uses that carbon to, to combine with hydrogen to produce an electric fuel. Um, and it's deployed in significant amounts. That's actually 600 million metric tons a year. Um, so that's functionally the, uh, a pretty large new industry. Um, but as I said, there actually has been a lot of uh, recent advancements in that technology, which is, which is exciting. Um, so some conclusions, again, technically feasible uh, to reduce fossil CO2 emissions in the U.S. consistent with 350 ppm globally. Uh, and I can say that um, even if we're overestimating the available zero carbon biomass, or we're optimistic about consumer adoption of electrification technologies, or um, we uh, have uh, limited our use of uh, net negative technologies um, or if we don't see land use contributions like we'd like um, and finally uh, we can also do that even if we don't build new nuclear plants. Um, what does it require though? Uh, energy efficiency and electrification, um, rapid suspension of the use of coal and electricity uh, and really getting to near zero emissions in electricity by 2040, uh, balancing that electricity uh, through an integration with uh, electric fuels and direct air capture, um, deployment of, of bio-based fuels, uh, kind of to mop up everything that we haven't been able to electrify, uh, use of carbon capture where we can, specifically on high uh, utilization industrial facilities, uh, and then also uh, potentially use of direct air capture either for uh, utilization or the production of electric fuels or direct sequestration. So, thank you. We use, the, we, we use their model as a basis for our energy service demand projections. And so when I say energy service demand, I just mean the things we want energy to do. So let us drive miles, heat our homes, perform industrial processes, those things. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, you uh, talked about uh, direct air capture and carbon capture. Those may be new concepts. Can you just tell us about the distinction between those two? Yeah. So, um, uh, carbon capture, uh, carbon capture, uh, uh, there's different technical ways of doing it. But basically, carbon capture says you've emitted some carbon dioxide but from combusting fuel. Uh, well, you can put it through a chemical process and separate it out from the effluents. Uh, concentrate it and then do something with it. Um, uh, often what you want to do with it is store it so you can store it in um, saline uh, aquifers for example. It's something that's been going on actually for decades in the oil industry in particular so it's not a novel technology but it hasn't been used very much in this kind of application. Um, that is something applied to a combustion process. 
There is a related technology that's really just emerging, but starting to show quite a bit of promise, uh, uh, called direct air capture that allows you to actually suck CO2 out of the atmosphere. And I think maybe this is a moment to sort of address the moral hazard question uh, straight on. Um, because uh, Ben certainly described it, I alluded it to it earlier, talking about sort of trade-offs and toolkits and all that sort of stuff. People have reasonably talked about um, uh, uh, the prospects of something like carbon capture as a fig leaf that would permit us to continue on indefinitely with our current sort of um, uh, crazy energy system that's destabilizing the climate. And if that was what we were talking about, then I would agree with them, but it's not. The problem is we're in such a pickle right now that we can build a completely clean energy system and we're still going to have to suck CO2 out of the atmosphere. We're not in the position to say if we put solar on our roof and ride our bicycle and eat vegetarian that that's going to cure the problem. It'll, it'll help at the margin, but it won't help with the main chance. Unfortunately, we're going to have to do a lot of these big industrial things like carbon capture. And then can you make a um, distinction between carbon capture and storage and carbon capture and utilization, which is also something very different that you are bringing in here? Well, I'll give that to Ben because he some of the most innovative work in this whole area, and it's really quite exciting from a technical standpoint. Uh, yeah, basically, uh, electric fuels uh, use hydrogen, uh, which we produce through electrolysis, um, and they also use carbon. Uh, so you can produce basically a synthetic, more or less a synthetic fossil fuel or a synthetic fuel through the combination of those two products. So we know how to produce hydrogen, but we also need to basically have CO2 available to complete that chain. Uh, in the future, there aren't a whole lot of point sources of CO2 available, luckily. That's sort of the game. Um, but yeah, so where you do have those available, you need to put capture so that they can basically produce this product that can then be turned into fuels and it, it basically creates a circle, right? Um, you burn that fuel, that CO2 goes back up and then you pull it out of the atmosphere. Um, so. Thank you. All right, so uh, I'll stop monopolizing the questions and uh, we'll start right here. I'm just gonna move around as quickly as I can. Please keep your questions short. Thank you. Hi, thanks for your presentation. So as I understand it, and I know you've covered it somewhat with your trade-offs, but there's still a sort of basic assumption of supportive public policies to reach a conclusion of feasibility. And um, I'm, I'm wondering why you feel it's absolutely necessary to create a scenario where there's no reduction on the energy demand side where there's still the same assumptions of growth in population, GDP, vehicle miles traveled? It's a great question. You want me to? End? Um, yeah, so in terms of sort of the feasibility, feasibility uh, including public policy, we just, we view that as actually sort of reversed. It's, we've actually seen a lot over the last few years that public policy follows modeling exercises like these in some ways instead of um, vice versa. Um, oftentimes that kind of the technical feasibility is used uh, or understood as a reason for increasing the ambition of the actual policies. And we definitely saw that in California. We've seen it in the Northwest. Um, you know, representing what we actually have to do from a concrete perspective is the first step. You know, we can't, we certainly can't say that it's feasible from a public policy perspective just because we don't know what that public policy will be, but we don't want to make that a constraint because then we'll never kind of be able to see these systems and then be able to use those as uh, an imperative for public policy to follow. Um, in terms of uh, energy services demand, it's really just a communication. You know, we can reduce energy services kind of linearly um, and, but it does open us up to criticism 
that the only way we were able to meet these was basically by reducing what we expected from our energy system and it doesn't make a large enough impact to be comp completely honest it doesn't make a significant enough impact in the nature of these systems to open ourselves up to that criticism we totally want it to happen again because the scale of the system is different if we expect less of it but it's not a necessity and we don't want to claim that it is basically yeah it's 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 that it's the strategic question. How do you frame your work? And we decided a long time ago with our earlier work that we were going to make apples to apples comparisons. Obviously, at the, Julia not long ago said, "Can't we do without some of this crap that we buy?" And of course, we should do without this crap that we should buy. But our point was to say, given a projection of the way we live our lives right now, even still, and even as badly as we've screwed this all up, there is some hope of pulling this fat out of the fire if we were to act very rapidly and very aggressively. That was the case we make. Not, not to discount the idea that it would be a very good thing to do more conservation and live um, sort of uh, uh, less materialistic lifestyles, for sure. Yeah, and I'll just add to that, in terms of litigation and trying to get an enforceable decree from a court, it's a much easier legal argument to make that the remedy is feasible, even if we're using the Department of Energy's own projections for energy demand in the United States. And then it's incumbent upon all of you to go out there and when our government is preparing this plan and talking about our policies going forward, that maybe we wanna eliminate the nuclear or s some of the direct air capture or the biomass and we wanna advocate for um, new ways of living in the world and reducing our consumption so we don't need as much as DOE says we need for the next 35 years. And that's really a policy conversation we need to keep having. But to win a case, what the work that EER has done is critical using the government's own data and its own numbers to show that this is feasible. All right, next questions up here. Um, my question is about the cost of all this. Um, and also, when uh, Julia talks about um, our living a different lifestyle, one of the things that we have to really realize is that this comes down harder on the poor than it does on middle class people. Um, they can't afford to go buy a new car, and, and so I, neither can I, actually. So how do we get, is that gonna be government funds or what? So uh, speaking to the cost again. So um, there are a couple of things uh, in terms of the costs. I think you have hit on it that the nature of the cost change. So right now we have very, we obviously have a fossil fuel based economy. Uh, that's kind of basically an ongoing cost economy. You know, we pay that bill every month um, instead of buying a new car and then paying far less for the electricity to run it. Uh, as we move into the future, that is the new nature of it is basically it's infrastructure investment. It's buying a new car. It's not paying that oil bill every, or it's not paying that kind of gasoline bill every month. So it's basically you're paying for operating cost savings with basically investment. Huge need for basically government policy to incentivize uh, electric vehicles so that that upfront cost can be mitigated and the ongoing cost savings can be realized. Um, on the energy supply side, as we move towards electricity, electricity is actually one of the few energy types that we really do pretty well in terms of managing its impact on the poor. Um, there are you know, lower income rates and things like that. The types of fuels that we have no control over are oil, right? And those go away. Um, you know, the worst possible thing is basically oil price spikes for low income people right now. Um, and we do mitigate against that. I think functionally you have a lot more control over how you allocate those costs as upfront investments than we've seen in kind of the fossil fuel economy right now. Um, of course the Green New Deal is under discussion and we've been thinking about some analogs. I mean we, we're not proposing policy. We're basically describing what we think policy needs to accomplish and people who work in policy um, uh, are going to need to figure this out for it to happen. But looking back historically, 
Um, one of the aspects of the, green new, of the original New Deal was rural electrification. In a period of a decade or so, um, rural America went from being not electrified to being almost 100% electrified, largely through the leadership of the federal government. And that included uh, ways of making um, electrical equipment in the home affordable and available for people with very low incomes. So maybe there's a modern electrification uh, analog in some future Green New Deal. All right, more questions? Got one here. Hi there, thanks for the work and the presentation. Can you talk a little bit about the um, peer review process you've either already subjected this to or plan to subject it to? Um, so, uh, what you're seeing at this stage is a report, and we're in the process of writing up the report for submission to a journal article. The original method that we use um, uh, was uh, written up in an article in Science a few years back, and I can provide the link to that if you like. No, we've, we've, uh, but we're, we're in the process of, of uh, of submitting um, this over hopefully in the next few months. Thank you. Questions up here? All right. I'm going to go to the back. Thank you. Uh, t uh, just two quick questions. I didn't hear you specifically mention renewable natural gas, so I'd be interested in hearing your comments on that. And then second, you said that emissions reductions from the U.S. were consistent with 350 parts per million. How did you figure out how to, what burden the U.S. assumes compared to the rest of the world? How did you figure out how many steps I'm going to have to run back and forth? <laughs> Matt, you're getting good exercise here. Um, uh, I want to briefly uh, uh, address another component of your question about cost. But, uh, and I'm not sure that this came across in our oral presentation, but um, the cost that we're t describing, uh, 1 or 2% <laughs> of GDP, that's the cost of supplying and using energy. It doesn't have anything to do with the with the avoided cost of not having the impacts of climate change, pollution, and so forth, which also can have a differential effect on the poor. So I think that's outside our scope. That's not what we do. But there's been a lot of study of that question. I think to get the full picture, you need to think both about what are the costs, but also what are the benefits. Um, with regard to the, uh, the question about burden sharing, again, we didn't address that. We, took uh, Jim Hansen's trajectories and we applied those to the United States. Um, that was the, uh, the uh, he didn't allocate those out to individual countries. Our task was to see if we could do that, if we could follow that trajectory on our own. And I think the, what we learned uh, from our earlier experience with the Deep Decarbonization Pathways Project is that uh, one way of thinking about the burden sharing problem is not necessarily um, differential targets as um, supporting equitable development that allows all countries, regardless of their economic development status, to achieve the necessary reductions. And that could definitely involve transfers or other kinds of, uh, of equity actions, including technology transfer. Uh, in terms of renewable natural gas, uh, the generally speaking, natural gas is the fossil fuel you want to displace the least because it's the cheapest. Um, and so the avoided cost of it is very low. Um, so generally speaking, our biofuels went to uh, displace liquid fuels first, and our electric fuels went to displace liquid fuels first, and natural gas was only displaced basically if it if there was a residual need for emissions reductions. But it was... It was behind replacing oil-based products on the... Displacement towering buildings, right? It's, it's displaced by moving to electricity, but you don't displace the fuel directly. Yeah. But, but limited. So, so there was power. There's power to X, but power to methane is not... Is one of the options, but it doesn't get used as much as power to liquids. Um, because functionally, producing a liquid-based fuel is $20 an MMBTU. Replacing gas is $5 in MMBTU. Um, at $5 in MMBTU, just the economics of that suggested that power to liquids made more sense. Thanks. 
And we got a uh, last question up here. You're just here. Um, I don't know enough about this to ask this really intelligently, but my understanding is that in producing heat from electricity, you've wasted a lot of heat. And so my question is if the heat pump technology or other technologies are efficient enough or if we're still dealing with a heat loss problem in heating and cooling houses. So generally speaking, people talk about electric heat being inefficient because they're talking about the whole chain um, of producing that electricity in thermal power plants, which have an efficiency of about 40%. And they're including line losses to deliver that electricity. And then, but the actual electric heaters themselves are efficient. So even a resistance heater is basically 99% efficient. Heat pumps are actually 300% efficient because they don't require the same amount of energy to produce that heat. When we've moved to renewable sources, kind of the old paradigm of combining the efficiency of a thermal power plant doesn't make any sense because we don't use thermal power plants anymore. Um, so it kind of changes the nature of that. Um, but the actual electrification, direct electrification process in every case is more efficient than the fuel combustion process it dis displaces from an end use base perspective. Great. And uh, thanks for our panel. And thank you.